Hello, everybody. Thank you for being here this evening. I know I thought I'd surprise you by being over here. It's a sneaky way of getting your attention. Aha! I'm Marilyn Heron, director of the Rogers Center for Holocaust Education and professor in the departments of religious studies and history. Tonight's lecture by Dr. Rowan Doran of Stanford University is truly a collaborative event co-sponsored by the Fish Interface Center, the Department of History, the Department of Religious Studies, the Institute for the Study of Religion, Economics, and Society, and the Rogers Center. I, I, I uh, pondered whether I should say Dr. Rowan's honorarium is so huge that it took five departments to sponsor it, but that would be a lie. We're, we're sponsoring it because we all really wanted him uh, to come and be here tonight. I want to especially thank Dr. Carice Doten Snitker, postdoctoral fellow in the Institute, for suggesting Dr. Doran as a speaker. <clears throat> My colleague, Dr. Nancy Martin, chair of the Religious Studies Department, We'll introduce our speaker from up there in a moment, and we'll have the opportunity for questions after the presentation, and there will also be a time for conversation at the informal reception after the event. As you probably know, the number of anti-Semitic incidents in the U.S., ranging from verbal harassment to violent attacks, is on the rise. In a recent report, the ADL cites a 36% increase in 2022 over the previous year, the highest number recorded since the ADL began its survey in 1979. Preceding 19th century racist anti-Semitism stands the long history of religious anti-Judaism with its stereotypes, caricatures, and false accusations. We have heard them so often that we may think we know their history, know their origins. But as we will learn tonight, that history is more complex, more nuanced, and more surprising than we may realize. <clears throat> Tonight's lecture and the truly extraordinary, and I use that term advisedly, extraordinary depth of archival research on which it draws, namely 150 archives, reminds us of how vital historical research is in shaping our understanding and equally important, shaping our actions today. And now to introduce our speaker, the Chair of Religious Studies, Dr. Nancy Martin. I have the honor of introducing our esteemed speaker this evening, but before I do, I want to thank Marilyn Heron for all her work in organizing tonight's program for the benefit of us all, as well as giving me this honor. Thank you, Marilyn. Rowan Doran is Assistant Professor of History at Stanford University, where he also serves as a core faculty member for the Taub Center for Jewish Studies. Born and raised in Western Canada, Professor Doran did his undergraduate and doctoral work at Harvard University, earning an MPhil in medieval history from the University of Cambridge in the process. And before coming to Stanford, he was a junior fellow at the Harvard Society of Fellows. Professor Doran is a historian of Western Europe and the Mediterranean, primarily during the High and Late Middle Ages. Much of his research tries to understand how law and society interact with each other, especially where legal norms conflict with social practices. Another strand of his research explores the history of economic life and economic thought, especially medieval debates over usury and money lending. The recipient of numerous awards, fellowships, and grants, he has published some 18 articles, co-edited three volumes, and is in the process of editing a fourth, and published a number of digital projects, as well as translating the works of others for inclusion in edited volumes. His book, No Return, Jews, Christian Usurers, and the Spread of Mass Expulsion in Medieval Europe, was published by Princeton University Press in January of this year. In this book, he uses the banishment of Jewish and Christian moneylenders to explore the rise 
of mass expulsions as a widespread practice in the late Middle Ages with tragic consequences that reverberate into the present. His book has been described as a masterpiece of legal and historical scholarship that speaks to issues of our own day. He's also currently engaged in a project examining the ways in which medieval canon law was adapted, reinterpreted, or resisted in local contexts in the 13th and 14th centuries. This project builds on corpus syn syndal syndal sorry, syndaloi syndalium, sorry about that, uh, a searchable full text database of late medieval local ecclesiastical legislation that he's been developing since 2016 with assistance from colleagues around the world, and for which he received the Duziak Prize for Digital Legal History in 2022 from the American Society of Legal History. The title of Professor Dorn's lecture this evening is No Longer Welcome, Jews, Christians, and the Spread of Mass Expulsion in Medieval Europe. Please join me in welcoming Professor Doran. Thank you, Professor Martin, for that introduction. Uh, thank you, Professor Harron, for gathering everyone here together. Uh, thank you, Dr. Dilton Snitker, for suggesting my name in the first place. Um, I'm grateful for such a warm welcome, especially when, as you'll hear more about in a moment, I spend so much of my time thinking about those who are made to feel unwelcome by their host communities. Um, and so I'm especially grateful as well for the support of so many campus units in welcoming here um, and I'm so happy to see a number of students in the audience this evening, along with sort of colleagues um, and community members. Um, and so students, like beyond notice, like I really, really hope that you'll ask questions at the end of this uh, presentation. Um, so sort of, you know, be thinking about them already, because I'm going to be looking to you afterwards um, to sort of start the discussion. Uh, as someone who was raised Catholic and who now spends a great deal of time engaging with Judaism, both in my professional life and at home with my Jewish spouse and daughter, I find it particularly meaningful to be here in this beautiful interfaith center. The very existence of such a center would have been inconceivable to the people whose worldview and experiences I seek to understand every day. That such a place exists at all, let alone take such inspiring form, is therefore a monument to how far we've come, even if as with all places and programs that seek to facilitate interfaith understanding, it also reminds us of how much work remains to be done. Let me begin my talk this evening by bringing you right back to the Middle Ages, and specifically to the Kingdom of France in the winter of 1269. King Louis IX, Saint Louis, as he would soon be known, was preparing to go on crusade again. Two decades earlier, his first crusade had ended in humiliating failure. So this time, he had decided to purge the kingdom of the sins that had surely led God to strip away his favor the last time around. And so we find King Louis issuing mandates against prostitutes, blasphemers, corrupt judges, and various other wrongdoers. Among these mandates is one issued in January of 1269, which opens with a denunciation of those who'd been, quote, openly lending usuriously on pledges within our realm, having set up houses especially for this purpose, in which they greatly impoverish our realm through their usurious extortions, and they are said to commit many evils within their houses. And so King Louis ordered his bailiffs to expel these usurers from their jurisdictions within three months. Now, for most of us, when we think about usury and money lending in the Middle Ages, we generally think of the Jews, especially when we throw the punishment of expulsion into the mix. But the targets of King Louis's wrath were not Jews. Even though it's certainly true that Jews, some of the money lenders, were expelled repeatedly in the Middle Ages. Because Jews were far from the only people lending money, and they were far from alone in being expelled for usury. And the targets of King Louis's wrath were in fact Christians, so-called Lombards or Coercins, natives of northern Italy, especially the region we now know as Piedmont, famous for good wine, among other things. And they had left their homes and crossed the Alps in search of economic opportunities, 
In establishing credit operations in the Kingdom of France, they were emblematic of a broader historical phenomenon, the rapid spread of professional Christian moneylenders across much of Western Europe in the 13th and 14th centuries. The impact of their geographic diffusion is still visible in the urban topographies of 21st century Europe. London's Lombard Street is merely the most famous of the many streets and districts that bear the name by which these Italian moneylenders were commonly known. Even more striking is the fact that Lombard eventually came to serve as the word for pawn shop in many European languages. And in light of later anti-Semitic tropes, there's a certain irony in the fact that one of the languages in which Lombard means pawn shop is Yiddish. Thanks to the painstaking work of generations of scholars, we know a great deal about the recurring expulsions of Jews that scar the history of medieval and early modern Europe. Entire books have been devoted to the circumstances and aftermaths of individual expulsions, while other studies have explored the dynamics of successive expulsions within particular regions. Historians studying the Jewish diaspora have meticulously retraced the pathways of exile and the destinations of refugees, while specialists in literature and liturgy have movingly evoked the impact of such forced dislocations on the shared rituals and cultural life of Europe's Jewish communities. As many of you know, these expulsions were rooted in the increasing anxieties, fears, and hostility of the Christian majority towards Jews and Judaism, fueled by a toxic combination of theological developments, political struggles, and powerful economic and social transformations. Until the late 15th century, many of those responsible for ordering such expulsions justified them, at least in part, by invoking the specter of Jewish usury and the evils that supposedly followed in its wake. Now, I've been throwing around the word usury here without actually saying what I mean by it or what people in the Middle Ages might have meant by it. Both now and then, usury is essentially any interest on a loan that exceeds what is permissible. In California at the moment, that threshold is basically 10% for loans between private parties. But if you're borrowing from a bank or a credit union or a payday lender or a pawn shop, then there's no limit whatsoever, unless you're in the military, in which case you can't be charged more than 36%. As you can see, it gets fairly complicated and it gets much, much more complicated from there. And in the Middle Ages, it's even more complicated. Again, usury was essentially any interest on a loan that exceeded what was permissible. But there were lots of competing views about what rate was permissible and what counted as interest, or even what counted as a loan. Under Roman law, which remained widely used in much of medieval Europe, the maximum allowable rate of interest was 12%. But in both Catholic theology and law, any interest on a loan qualified as usury, and hence is forbidden, with a few rather complicated exceptions. Meanwhile, professional moneylenders in the Middle Ages, Jews and Christians alike, often received formal licenses from local authorities, allowing them to charge up to two pennies per pound per week, or 43% a year, which sounds bad, but is still 10 times lower than the going rate at some payday lenders in the contemporary United States. So in practice, if you were lending money in the Middle Ages, the same loan might be perfectly listed under secular law and blatantly usurious under church law which meant that you might be a moneylender in the eyes of one person and a usurer in the eyes of another. So when I use the words usury and usurer this evening, I'm transmitting medieval accusations about what someone was doing, which might have very little connection to their actual economic practices. In short, moneylending is a practice and usury is an accusation. Now along with all of the excellent scholarship on medieval expulsions of Jews, a lot of excellent scholarship over the last hundred years has also been devoted to understanding the stereotypical association between Jews, money lending, and usury, which emerges in the Middle Ages and persists, unfortunately, down to the present day. Now, notwithstanding the assertions of some zealous medieval clerics and some equally zealous 19th and 20th century anti-Semites, it is blatantly untrue that in the Middle Ages, all Jews were money lenders. The more interesting misconception, not least because it's so widely believed within the modern Jewish community, is that in the Middle Ages, only Jews were moneylenders. 
This misconception tends to be bolstered by references to the medieval church's vociferous and repeated condemnations of Christian usury, ignoring the simple fact that repeated condemnations are usually a sign of persistent practices. Even very distinguished scholars have been led astray by the assumption that medieval money lending was monopolized by Jews. One of the most widely cited articles on the topic of medieval Jewish money lending is a 1978 article by the eminent Princeton historian William Chester Jordan. In this article, Professor Jordan relied on three documentary sources, all of which he believed to be records of Jewish lending activity in mid-13th century France. Two of the documents do indeed record Jewish loans to Christian borrowers. But the third is actually a roster of loans made by Christian lenders. And we know that not only because the names of the two lenders are typical of Christians rather than Jews, but also because one of the things they accepted as collateral was a small herd of pigs. Now, these records, as I might note, were drawn up during the reign of King Louis IX of France, the same King Louis with whom I began this talk. And as my opening example revealed, just as Jews were frequently expelled on grounds of usury over the course of the Middle Ages, so too were Christians. Within the Kingdom of France alone, a fluctuating blend of moral opprobrium, political expediency, and downright greed spurred rulers to order the expulsion of Lombard moneylenders on at least 10 occasions before the middle of the 14th century. I first stumbled across these, these expulsions while looking for something else, which is how an awful lot of historical research projects get started. Note to the students in the audience. They seized my attention because they didn't fit into the usual Jews, usury, expulsion narrative that I was familiar with. And as I dug further, it became increasingly clear to me that medieval expulsions of Jews could not be fully understood without considering the broader association of usury and expulsion in contemporary rhetoric and practice. Now, I've circulated a map, so hopefully most of you got the map when you walked in, but keep an eye out for your map. Um, Next, there's two maps that together show you what I mean. The map on the top shows the territories that ordered expulsions of Jews in the 250 years before the Black Death. Now, as you can see, for those of you who know your European geography, it's centered around the Kingdom of France, um, along with a few territories on the edges of France. There's the Duchy of Brabant to the north, the County of Burgundy to the east, the Dauphiné to the southeast, as well as the Kingdom of England across the Channel. And there's also a little tiny outlier on the map um, in central Italy, which is the city of Perugia. And the map on the bottom shows the territories that ordered expulsions of foreign Christian usurers during the same period. As you'll already have noticed, the two maps are almost identical, except that the Christian map includes a few other territories up in the Low Countries, as well as the Prince Bishopric of Aquileia at the top of the Adriatic Sea. From the beginning of the 12th century to the middle of the 14th, every major European polity that ordered the expulsion of its Jewish community also ordered the expulsion of foreign Christian usurers. Let me repeat that. Up until the Black Death, every major European polity that ordered the expulsion of a Jewish community also ordered the expulsion of foreign Christian usurers. It's conceivable that this geopolitical overlap is pure coincidence, but I hope you'll agree that's unlikely. The book that I ended up writing is my attempt to explore the connections between expulsions of Jews and expulsions of Christian usurers over the course of the Middle Ages. These connections ended up being bound up with migration patterns, credit networks, the meaning of foreignness, the limits of citizenship, even the forbidding thickets of biblical exegesis and legal hermeneutics. And tracing these connections has accordingly led me through a broad array of sources, from chronicles and legal commentaries to account rolls and notarial registers and from theological treatises to popular songs. As you might imagine, these sources are widely scattered and often fragmentary. And as Professor Heron mentioned, I end up consulting material from a lot of archives and libraries in 16 countries. Now, I'm not going to attempt to lead you through all of that this evening. Um, what I would like to do this evening instead uh, is to highlight one of the book's principal themes, which is how ideas and practices of expulsion spread across the intellectual and legal landscape of medieval Europe, and how these ideas and practices could mutate and evolve as they moved across time and place and genre 
engulfing new targets along the way. And then I'll zoom out again at the end and try my best to articulate why we should care about what happened so many centuries ago. Let me pause for just a moment, though, and say something about expulsion. After all, expulsion's a rather capacious term, and the single word can encompass a host of similarly capacious phenomena. Exile, banishment, deportation. But at least when we're talking about expulsions of Jews, we're usually thinking of a particular kind of expulsion, what's often called mass expulsion, but what we might more precisely call collective expulsion, the forced removal of an entire category of persons from the boundaries of the expelling authority. We don't tend to think of expulsion as having a history. After all, for everyone in the Middle Ages, and for many Jews, Christians, and Muslims today, history began with an act of expulsion, the banishment of Adam and Eve from paradise. As for collective expulsion, over the last century, it's been so commonplace in so many countries across so much of the globe that it seems almost embedded in the fabric of human societies. And yet, by historical standards, the proliferation of collective expulsion is a relatively recent phenomenon, as the historian Benjamin Kedar pointed out 30 years ago in an essay in the Journal of World History. Ancient empires regularly uprooted their subject populations and relocated them to other places within their dominions. Just think here of the people of Judea being carted off to Babylon. And Roman authorities frequently banished offending groups from the precincts of the capital, or even from peninsular Italy as a whole. But the expulsion of whole classes of people beyond imperial boundaries was all but unknown under Roman rule. And the practice remained equally rare in the successor kingdoms that followed, as well as the Byzantine and Ottoman empires. It was only during the high and late, medieval age, and late Middle Ages that collective expulsion first emerged as a characteristic feature of Western political practice, targeting not only Jews, but also heretics, foreigners, and other groups. This is important because it suggests that collective expulsion is not a timeless or inevitable feature of human societies, however much the horrors of the 20th century might have entrenched the practice in our collective consciousness. And if we understand collective expulsion instead as a practice that emerged and spread within a particular set of historical circumstances, then we can start investigating both the conditions under which it emerged and the mechanisms by which it spread. By way of analogy, we might think here of the enormous amount of research that's been done over the last half century on the history of mass incarceration, which is another relatively recent phenomenon by global historical standards. Historians, and I include here historical sociologists and other like-minded scholars, historians who work on nearly every place and period have mapped the rise and diffusion of practices of confinement, tracing how we've moved from a pre-modern world in which incarceration was exceptional or even unknown into one in which it's endemic. But very, very few scholars have sought to tackle the history of expulsion in the same way, which is one of the reasons that I was so excited to discover Dr. Doton Snicker's research on the widespread expulsions of Jews in late medieval Germany. In general, and here Dr. Doton Snicker's work is an exception, scholars who have examined the history of Jewish expulsions have framed them within the broader context of persecutions of Jews. Expulsions are therefore treated alongside state-sponsored state confiscations, legal restrictions, pogroms, and all of the other awful things that people in the past have done to the Jews and Jewish communities who lived among them. There are good reasons for this approach, not least that it aligns with a venerable intellectual and liturgical tradition within Judaism itself, in which the tribulations of the Jewish people are collectively understood as the result of Sinat Israel, hatred of the Jews, which can take many forms as it manifests itself across time and place. Those of you who will be participating in Passover seders next week might well vocalize such an approach in singing or reciting the traditional text Fahisha Amda with its reminder that in every generation, enemies rise up to destroy us. Such an approach also underpins one of the greatest works of Jewish history writing, Solomon Ibn Verga's Shevet Yehuda, which the author wrote after being driven from Spain in 1492, and which recounts 64 episodes of Jewish persecution and draws connections between them. 
There's no doubt that we have learned a great deal about the dynamics of Jewish expulsions by framing them within a wider context of Jewish persecution. But what if we make expulsion the object of our analysis? What if we start not from the targets of persecution, but from the tools? In other words, what if we frame Jewish expulsion not from the perspective of what else was being done to Jews, but from the perspective of who else was being expelled? Let me start by showing you quite briefly what this looks like for England, which has the dubious distinction of being the first country in Europe to expel its Jewish population. This expulsion occurred in 1290, during the reign of Edward I, a king who's most famous for thumping the Welsh and Scots in battle, but who also brought an end to England's once thriving Jewish community with an expulsion order that would not be reversed for 400 years. In England, the broader history of collective expulsion begins earlier, in the mid-12th century, when Edward's great-grandfather ushered in his reign by expelling all foreign mercenaries from the realm. And over the next century, English kings, including Edward's grandfather and father, repeatedly banished other communities of foreigners from the realm, often amidst trading disputes with Flanders or military conflicts with France. Starting in the 1240s, Edward's father, the very long reigning, very pious, and perennially broke Henry III, also began repeatedly ordering the expulsion of Italian merchant bankers from the realm, usually on the grounds that they were engaging in illegal usurious lending. In fact, the real reason that Henry expelled these Italians was because they refused his demands for bribes or cheap loans, and the threat of expulsion was one way to encourage them to pay up. As for King Edward, he follows suit upon taking the throne in 1272, first expelling Flemish merchants from the realm as part of a commercial dispute, and then a year later expelling Italian merchant bankers on charges of usury. And right after expelling these Italian merchants, Edward goes on to prohibit the kingdom's Jews from lending at interest, that is, from engaging in usury according to a strict Catholic definition of the term. So by 1290, when Edward expels the kingdom's Jews on the grounds that they were persistently violating this earlier prohibition on usury, he's not just building on a long tradition of expelling perceived outsiders from the realm. He's building on quite a robust tradition of expelling perceived outsiders specifically on grounds of usury. Now, I'm skimming over a hugely complex situation here, and if any of you are really interested in the nuts and bolts of medieval English history, believe me, I am very happy to go into more detail in the discussion. Um, but one piece of evidence is worth highlighting, because it's gone entirely unnoticed by all of the scholars who've examined Edward's expulsion. In the late spring of 1290, at the same time that Parliament was urging King Edward to consider expelling England's Jews, Parliament was also pushing Edward to expel foreign merchants from the realm. Edward refused the latter demand, declaring, quote, he understands that the merchants are suitable and useful to the leading men of the realm, and he's not advised to expel them. So instead of just seeing 1290 as the final dramatic blow to medieval England's Jewish community, which it certainly was. We can also understand it as a moment in which Edward is choosing to expel one group while refusing to expel another. And that suddenly opens up a host of new questions that we can ask. Why at this moment were the foreign merchants deemed useful while the Jews were deemed expendable? Who were the advisors who had succeeded in convincing the king that one group should be shielded from expulsion, notwithstanding parliamentary pressure, and so forth? Now, what happened in England was obviously very important, indeed devastating, to the Jews who'd been living in England. But for an example of how ideas about expulsion could spread over much wider territory, we have to jump across the channel and also jump a few years back in time. In 1274, or four years after poor King Louis IX of France died of dysentery while leading his army on a second failed crusade, the Pope convened a general council of the church in Lyon, a city just beyond the southeastern boundaries of the Kingdom of France. Some of the participating bishops had written in advance to raise continued concern about the spread of usurious practices. And so the gathered prelates duly approved two decrees against usurers, which were theoretically binding on all of Latin Christendom. We can ignore one of these, um, which has laid out the rules that penitent Christian usurers had to follow if they wished to reconcile with the church 
upon their deathbeds. But the other decree opens with the image of an all-consuming abyss of usury, usurarum viraginem in the Latin, which became the shorthand way of referring to the decree. Usurarum viraginem ordered all secular and ecclesiastical rulers to expel from their lands within three months any foreigners who were openly engaging in usury. It also forbade anyone from renting houses to such usurers, and it imposed a raft of serious penalties for transgressors. The decree's demands marked a milestone. While previous medieval expulsion orders had concerned cities, duchies, or kingdoms, the decree's provisions theoretically embraced all of Latin Christendom. Not since the age of the Roman Emperor Justinian had a European authority issued such a sweeping and categorical call for the collective banishment of wrongdoers. Moreover, thanks to its codification in church law, the decree ended up circulating far and wide throughout Western Europe, being included in textbooks for law students, handbooks for confessors, manuals for preachers, and even a really terrible poem. And so far as Catholic canon law was concerned, the decree remained formally on the books until 1917. This meant, of course, that for centuries to come, even in places where there was no prior tradition of expelling wrongdoers from one's communities, people could flip open a manuscript or listen to a traveling preacher and suddenly discover that certain classes of people should be so punished. Now, among the things that I discovered as I plowed through hundreds and hundreds of manuscripts of medieval canon law, and yes, that did start to get boring after a while, um, that thankfully often meant spending time in really pretty European cities, um, one of the things I discovered was that this decree borrowed heavily from King Louis's expulsion order, the one with which I began my talk. Louis's expulsion order was the source of the decree's three-month time frame, its implicit distinction between local and foreign usurers, and its penalty of expulsion, which was actually very rare in canon law. This borrowing from a secular source was problematic. After all, whatever skimpy precedence canon law could offer for the penalty of expulsion, it was poorly equipped to explain why the appropriate punishment for a given sin depended on the secular jurisdiction in which one was sinning. I mean, while it might make sense for the king of France to expel badly behaving foreigners from his kingdom, on what possible grounds would the Catholic Church draw a distinction between natives and foreigners when it came to sinful behavior? Added to that was the difficulty of determining what exactly made someone a foreigner in a medieval world of overlapping jurisdictions and indeterminate boundaries, not to mention the equally vexing problem of determining who held the relevant jurisdiction for implementing expulsion. And one other thing the drafters did not do was specify whether the decree was to apply to Jewish usurers as well as Christian ones. This is probably because it never occurred to them that it might be used against Jews. The 13th century church hierarchy certainly denounced Jewish usury but it had never tried to forbid it outright. Moreover, one of the few constants of the medieval church's teachings on the Jews had been a strong resistance to their expulsion. This position rested on the sturdy foundations of the letters of the Apostle Paul, along with the writings of St. Augustine. And over the course of the High Middle Ages, a series of papal rulings on the topic buttressed it yet further. Good Christian authorities could impose all sorts of unpleasant restrictions on Jews, and indeed, Church law actively encouraged them to do so, but expelling them was another matter altogether. And throughout the 13th century, church thinkers were virtually unanimous in asserting that Christian authorities could not justly expel Jews simply because they refused to become Christian or because they otherwise held to their traditional practices. Moreover, it's clear from a variety of sources, including the draft versions of the decree and eyewitness accounts, the user arm Viragem's provisions were aimed at Lombards, that is, foreign Christian professional usurers. But the language of the promulgated decree was unintentionally ambiguous. And you can probably already guess where this would lead. Only two months after the close of the Second Council of Lyon, the Bishop of Angers in western France promulgated a new collection of statutes for his diocese one of which dealt with the topic of usury. The papacy, declared Bishop Nicholas, had banned all individuals and communities from renting or leasing houses to anyone openly engaging in usury. 
since it was clear, continued the bishop, that the Jews of the Diocese of Angers openly engaged in the depravity of usury, all clergy and ecclesiastical institutions in the diocese were henceforth forbidden from renting houses to Jews or indeed allowing Jews to reside anywhere on church lands. I think Bishop Nicholas was quite aware that he was putting forth a strained reading of the decree in applying against Jews. Beyond a few subtle textual changes pointing this direction, the red flag is his omission of the decree's language of expulsion. The fact that Bishop Nicholas promulgated the decree's housing ban, but not its explicit expulsion provision, suggests that he had a sense that the council had not intended to target Jews, since otherwise it would have overturned nearly a thousand years of church teaching on the question of their expulsion. Whatever his own personal feelings on the legitimacy of expulsion, he was apparently unwilling, or perhaps unable, to push his reading of the conciliar decree to its logical end. As far as we can tell, Bishop Nicholas's statute had little immediate effect. But 15 years later, in 1289, the powerful Count of Anjou expelled Jews together with, quote, Lombards, Caracens, and other foreigners from his northern French domains. The Count's order not only drew on the image of an abyss of usury, but was issued, quote, upon consultation with his reverend bishops and other clerics. And in the roster that followed, the name of Bishop Nicholas of Angers was at the very top of the list. One does not need to look too hard to see Bishop Nicholas's influence at work, prodding the prince to carry out an expulsion from which the aged bishop himself had once shied away. As you might expect, this would not be the last time that European authorities interpreted or rewrote Usurarum Viraginum as applying to Jews, notwithstanding the intentions of its drafters. As the events in Angers reveal, the decree's ambiguous language opened up a dangerous crack in the church's traditional opposition toward Jewish expulsion. For even if Jew was a protected category, usurer was not. And at no point in the later Middle Ages did the church hierarchy clearly establish just how far the increasing repression of usurers could infringe on the established protections for Jews. And thus we find anti-Jewish interpretations of the decree being advocated by German and Italian bishops, by the most famous law professor in 14th century Europe, by the most acclaimed preacher in 15th century Italy, even by a pope. So the pope reversed his decision after being confronted with eyewitness testimony about the actual intentions of the decree's drafters. Whatever your preferred approach to constitutional interpretation of the contemporary United States, for 15th century Jews, it was a good thing that the Pope deferred here to original intent. Now, I certainly don't want you to come away from my lecture thinking that reinterpretations of this conciliar decree underpinned every instance of Jewish expulsion in late medieval Europe. Far from it. But in entrenching into law and learned culture the notion that usury might be justly punished with expulsion, the decree certainly helped disseminate ideas that could underpin calls for the expulsion of Jews who were increasingly dependent on money lending as the Middle Ages progressed. At the same time, however, there are many who refused to embrace an expansive reading of the decree's targets. The 15th century Franciscan, John of Capistrano, produced some of the most viciously anti-Jewish diatribes of his age. Yet in all of his sermons and treatises against Jews and against usury, in which he draws heavily on canon law, he nowhere suggests that the decree usurum virogenum could be applied to Jews. However expedient such a reading might have been for one so opposed to Jews, it was clearly further than his legal scruples allowed him to go. Other thinkers and authorities, many of them, followed Bishop Nicholas of Angers in charting an awkward middle path, wielding the decree's rental ban against Jews while sweeping the question of expulsion under the rug. Nothing in the decree itself could sustain such a bifurcated handling of its provisions. Nothing in the decree itself justified wielding the rental ban against Jewish and Christian usurers alike, with the expulsion sanction limited to Christian foreigners. What we're seeing here, I think, is the continued strength of the tradition going all the way back to the Apostle Paul and St. Augustine that insisted on the right of Jews to live peaceably in Christian society. Goodness knows that there were plenty of medieval Christian authorities who ran roughshod over this tradition, or who came up with compelling arguments to get around it. But even in the 14th and 15th centuries, 
a period that saw such disruption and dislocation for Europe's Jewish communities, this tradition was far from meaningless or moribund. Now, I recognize that it would be a bit strange to give a talk on medieval expulsions of Jews without mentioning the most well-remembered of them all, that of 1492. So if you'll indulge me for just a few more minutes, I'll offer a very brief Iberian Coda. It's often been remarked that unlike most earlier medieval expulsions of Jews, it was not usury, but rather anxieties around mass Jewish conversion and lingering Judaizing influences that underpinned the Alhambra decrees of 1492, by which the Catholic monarchs Ferdinand and Isabella ordered all Jews who would not convert to Christianity to depart from their realms. Although some contemporary Jewish and Christian observers saw resentment over the Jews' usurious riches as a contributing factor, the most famous of the expulsion edicts, the one issued for the Kingdom of Castile, made no mention whatsoever of usury, instead focusing exclusively on the wicked consequences of ongoing con communication between Jews and converts, conversos. But there was another decree for the Kingdom of Aragon that was only rediscovered a few decades ago. As with his Castilian counterpart, the Aragonese edict began by condemning Jewish subversion and apostasy, here embellished with a language of leprosy and contagion. King Ferdinand then turned to the matter of Jewish usury, denouncing the Jews for, quote, wickedly and mercilessly consuming the wealth and property of Christians through their enormous unbearable usury. The edict then continued. Given that those Christians who have come to another land to be usurers must be expelled from cities and towns, how much more should infidel usurers, seducers of Catholics and abettors of heretics, be expelled and kept apart from Catholics for the preservation and protection of both their souls and the Christian religion? Although the echoes of usurar and virogenum are clear, the royal reasoning was new. If even foreign Christian usurers merited banishment, then surely the penalties for Jews, here collectively denounced as usurers, ought to be at least as severe. Here it was irrelevant that usurar and virogenum did not target Jews. In this transformed logic, whatever punishments fell on Christians, Jews should suffer the same or worse. Thus, that a canonical sanction devised two centuries earlier to slow the spread of Christian money lending, come to play a supporting role in the great act of intolerance against Jews that signaled the end of one age and the beginning of another. In my remarks this evening and in my book, I've tried to show how one cannot explain the proliferation of expulsion in medieval Europe by looking only at the collective expulsions that proved the most dramatic, widespread, and enduring the expulsions of Jews. It therefore seems clear to me that along with studying the history of persecutions within particular groups, we must also study the history of the practices that cut across them. One must equally grapple with the expulsion of those who may not be conventionally reckoned among the persecuted, but who fell nevertheless within expulsion's reach. Such a comparative approach not only helps us understand the expulsions that did take place, but also sheds light on those that didn't. Why were Lombards expelled at one moment and Jews at another, or both together, or none at all? Comparison allows us to glimpse the roads not taken, the choices not made. And comparison sometimes even reveals unnoticed connections, as the twisting paths by which Usurar and Virogenum came to reinforce the expulsion of Jews from the lands of the crown of Aragon. But for those of you who are not professional historians, who aren't about to go digging through dense manuscripts and dusty archives in search of comparisons and connections, why should any of this matter to you? It matters, I think, because it reminds us that expulsion, like all social practices, could be observed, repeated, taught, and imitated across space, across time, and across different categories of targets. We are so often urged to learn from history that the arsenal of the past can be wielded for evil as well as for good. With each successive expulsion serving to further disseminate and normalize the practice, 
the expulsion of any one group made it more likely that others would suffer the same fate. And as we gather here in this interfaith chapel, and as we approach both the annual ritual commemoration of Exodus from Egypt, followed soon after by Holocaust Remembrance Day, we do well to remember that the persecution and oppression of any one group can become a template for the subsequent persecution and oppression of others. <laughs>